Yay! Hey, thanks for taking time out from your lunch. Um, I'm Jerry Ellsworth. I'm from Technical Illusions, and I'm going to talk about Cast AR, which is augmented reality glasses, um, and the Kickstarter that we did um, around that, um, which is very interesting, and then all the fallout of what uh, happens after Kickstarter and going into production, um, which we're right in the middle of right now. So um, if you have any like burning questions, go ahead and just uh, stop me along the way. We'll just do this kind of free form. Um, but to give you some background on uh, what Cast AR is and what the product is and how it came about. So uh, Cast AR came out of Valve Software. Um, I was part of their hardware R&D department. We were tasked with finding out um, what would enhance video games and make them better. So we were given free reign to explore everything from trying to read people's minds with galvanic skin response and EEG and read people's heart rate, look at their pupil dilation to see if they're engaged in the game, and even looking at their posture. And uh, we also looked at other types of input devices like game controllers, uh, uh, gloves, we did data, data gloves, stuff like that. And then also um, there was a strong interest in virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, so it's kind of interesting, uh, as we were developing these different uh, prototypes just to experiment with, I really didn't like uh, the concept of virtual reality and augmented reality at first. It was, it was kind of something I dreamed about, but my experiences with them was, wasn't very good um, over the years. So I tried some of the early uh, VR rigs that were were built in the 90s and kind of made me nauseous and, and headaches and stuff like that and and so um, I only supported uh, folks kind of passively in the, the group on that and but as we started building these prototypes I, I stumbled onto a, a strange property of retroreflective surfaces and uh, I was trying to solve this headache issue that is common with virtual reality rigs where you have a display very close to your eye and it causes eye strain. And I built this test rig on my workbench. It had projectors and lenses and stuff and a beam splitter in it. And I put a beam splitter in backwards. And in the room I had a, a piece of this retro reflective fabric that um, was used for some other experiments we were doing. And I was trying to look through this system and figure out like why I wasn't seeing an image. But then uh, I kind of peered across where this retroreflective surface was, and I saw this beautiful image kind of floating out there in the distance. I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And so it just kind of was sitting in the back of my mind of like, you know, what can you do if you were actually, instead of trying to put an image directly into your eyes, if you were to actually project it out into the world and be able to expand that distance out. And it turns out that after playing with that, I found that it solved tons of issues, like headache issues and, and thing, motion sickness went away with that because you're taking these images instead of um, putting them directly in your eyes where there could be you know, error and misalignment. You, you move that distance way out and all your error and misalignment gets reduced down to very shallow angles. And, and I, I started to get very excited about augmented reality at that point. It's like, wow, there's all these really interesting game experiences that we can have, and we have lightweight glasses. And so that's what I started doing. I started developing um, glasses that had two projectors on the, the rim of the glasses that would project out to this special fabric. And this fabric, what it does is when the image hits it, it bounces almost all the light directly back in the same direction it came. So the glasses I built were projecting out, and no one in the room could see what was happening on the surface because all the light was returning back to me. That was exciting because that meant that as many people as I wanted could sit around a table with this kind of surface rolled out on it, and they could have their own unique experience. So they could, they could see a totally different game. They could see the same game but a different part of the game. Uh, like for real-time strategies, you could have a fog of war where you see only your units and your little soldiers on the table and your opponents see their soldiers, but you don't get to see into their what they're doing. Um, so that was pretty interesting. So we kept exploring that and uh, refining it. And we came up with some simple game demos. Uh, 
one of our first demos that we put together was kind of a holographic zombie maze game. So we took some characters from Left 4 Dead, which was one of Valve's games, and we stuck them in a maze, and the zombies chase after your character, and we developed a wand where you could point in 3D space, and the, your character would chase the tip of the wand, so you'd be sitting here kind of waving your hand around, looking kind of like a, a, like a crazy person, because no one could see what you were seeing, and your character would follow it. And it turned out that once we started adding two, three people to this very simplistic game, it became very compelling. People were playing for two, three, four hours at a time with these prototypes that I was building. Um, the prototypes, we had a, a fond name for them. We called them the head crab because the first ones were huge projectors and weighed about 10, 15 pounds, and they projected you know, through a beam splitter and out into the world, and they pinch your nose, and you'd have these like deep grooves in your nose. But it was just compelling enough that people would wear these really painful glasses for for hours on end. Um, so, and unfortunately, uh, Valve didn't want to proceed with the, this project, and so a few of us from the hardware department got let go, and we were able to negotiate to get the the technology back. And so, Rick Johnson and I spent all of last year developing the glasses. We were developing this head tracking system that had sub-millimeter accuracy to make little holographic characters show up on the surface as if they were really there and have real presence, like you could reach out and touch them. You have to have sub-millimeter accuracy. When you move your head, the computer has to generate the correct graphics. So we developed that. It uses this infrared marker scheme where you put a marker down on the table and the glasses use a camera to triangulate your position off the marker. Um, from there, we developed some other optical systems for it. So we, we shrunk the glasses. We made some what we call the VR-AR clip-ons. So it's an optical path that clips onto the front of the glasses and redirects the light back into your eyes like a near-eye display, but it will have a flip-up um, shutter on it so you can go from see-through AR mode to a fully immersive VR mode by flipping the shutters down. We also refined the wand, so the wand has more features, like it had an analog, I know it has an analog stick and buttons and triggers and stuff like that. Uh, we developed an RFID grid that goes underneath the surface, this retroreflective surface, and it uses RFID tags, and we can locate those RFID tags that you can place on any object you, you want, like an, a D&D character. You put it down on the surface, we scan this array of RFID coils, and with centimeter accuracy, we can figure out where your D&D player is. So real-world objects, you put it down, we can render graphics around it. It could be a dragon shooting fire over at your opponents. And so we did that. We bootstrapped that all out of our savings. We worked you know, day and night. Um, when we needed to hire people, we pulled it out of our, our, our pockets. And then uh, last September, we we launched a Kickstarter, or maybe it was October, I can't remember now, <laughs> it feels like an eternity. Um, but leading the, the Kickstarter has been a very interesting experience for us. It's completely backwards from almost any other business I've ever done. Um, it's kind of changed the landscape of where we go in the future. And even preparing for the Kickstarter was crazy. We knew that we had this technology, but you had it was something you had to see to believe. So. We spent the year prior to Kickstarter, or half year before Kickstarter, going to different events like Maker Faire and showing the wand and the glasses and showing parts of the RFID grid to show that, to prove to the world that we weren't just vaporware, that we were actually building this, this technology. Um, we originally thought we were going to do Kickstarter like early in the summer. We're just like, man, we're going to... Once we get out of Valve, we're going to develop this tracking system and this and that, and we're just going to go right to Kickstarter. And it ended up, as we learned more about Kickstarter, we found out that it was way, way more difficult than we thought. Um, Kickstarter, um, to be successful these days, you have to have huge PR um, ahead of time, completely planned out. You have to have a, a strategy. You have to have compelling video, compelling demos, a story, a dream to sell people, which uh, Rick and I are engineers, so we're very practical. And that was very difficult for us. Like, 
and then that's why it took us so long to get to Kickstarter even like every little optical component we had to try to test the best we could ahead of time like the VR clip-ons were you know kept us up at night we're like we want to do this we need to prototype it far enough that we feel that when we say we're going to deliver it we can actually develop it in time and so making that leap to selling the dream was very difficult for engineers so I don't know if you're going to do a Kickstarter you know get some help from people that know how to spin a story I, I don't think we did a great job on our story but I think it helped that we showed a gajillion people ahead of time so um, when we we actually got ready to launch our Kickstarter we had um, we met our goal in like a day and a half or something like that. We had a goal of four hundred thousand dollars. That's where we figured we could just barely scrape by and make a pair of glasses. Um, we hit that the first day, and then uh, our first couple days. Then there's throughout the entire month we continue doing PR. We had the first week we had planned two news outlets where we would go at each day, two or three news outlets. So we were driving all over the the country and flying different places and going on TV shows and going on radio shows and um, some interesting things about Kickstarter as far as like how backing comes in which surprised us and was extremely depressing once you hit your funding goal your Kickstarter campaign flatlines until the end of the month no matter what you do we were trying everything to like restart the Kickstarter we were sitting at like five hundred thousand dollars and Rick and I are like, oh my goodness, it's gonna, we're gonna kill ourselves if, uh, you know, trying to develop this product with only five hundred thousand dollars, and we were going all over the place doing PR and just nothing, like we'd have like a New York Times article or something huge, what we thought was huge, and just be this tiny blip on our Kickstarter, we're like, ah, oh my God, and uh, one thing we we found is when you go. Uh, into a company with a product like ours and you show, like we went to game companies and we show it and we come out and we look at our Kickstarter, it'd be this huge spike. So far way through our campaign, we discovered we shouldn't be like going to conventional like press outlets. We need to get like into companies and into big audiences. So anyway, we continue with the Kickstarter campaign. The um, campaign the last day when we it was like our biggest day out of the entire campaign like everyone just waited like eBay to the last day like to see where it was gonna go and they um, they backed all at the last minute so last day we were it, it felt like we were a televangelist we were on a live video stream we were like alright folks come on come on we gotta get to a hundred thousand dollars I mean a million dollars and yeah you know, once we got over a million dollars it was a big relief for us um, so after that was all done, you know, we thought we were going to be on Easy Street at that point because we'd done all this legwork, and and I I'm experienced with production, so I kind of knew what was uh, ahead. But we hadn't planned on how do we staff a company over the holidays, so we we pretty much clo our Kickstarter closed just before Thanksgiving, and we started reaching out to engineers like, hey, come work with us. They're like, well, you know, I'm going on vacation. I'll be back at the beginning of the year. And ends up we had all through the holidays, we had like zero traction. And then it took us, you know, the first couple months of the year just to build up a team. You know, and of course, you know, we're falling behind and like we're getting panicked and trying to find ways to accelerate it. And so it, the way Kickstarter turns things inside out, like a conventional VC funded company, you would go out and get some angel money, uh, you could go and develop a product, and then you go and you look for money to actually ship that product. And it's completely different. Now we have guns pointed to our head, and people are emailing us like pissed off all the time that because we didn't send an update that week, or we didn't do something, or we weren't giving them enough attention. So. It's it's scary. I mean, I <laughs> I uh, Kickstarter. Would I do it again? I don't know. Uh, just because of that, 
you know, uh, our product, there's some interesting things that are going on out there, though, because of our product. It's really the next emerging technology is AR, VR type experiences. So the goodwill that we're getting from companies out um, in the industry, like we had anticipated that we would have to use um, these FPGA chips to do our first pair of glasses, but we'd have to quickly move away from these um, these parts so that we could move to this thing called a metallized gate array, which is a very expensive proposition to get the cost down. Um, turns out that companies like Altera um, really want this technology, this wearable technology to exist. So they reached out to us and, and uh, gave us help and engineering and preferred pricing so that we continue to use their chips. And we've seen that with other vendors as well. Um, just because certain companies want you to um, make this happen so that they can sell a gajillion chips into that market. Um, we have a, a partner that's doing our optics. Um, they've donated tons of uh, engineering resources to us just because they were part of a market that was dying and now they see this as an opportunity to um, do more design work. So they're doing stuff up front for us, you know, just goodwill, just because they, they liked the project and they were impressed where we were. Um, uh, it, interesting thing is I've, I've done a lot of consumer products and I've had issues with sourcing parts uh, and like the Altera parts and stuff, it was a big surprise how easy it was to solve that problem. But other things that were never a problem before when I was doing toys that were selling in like 200, 300,000 units is like cables. Cables is one of those things you would think would be super, super simple to um, to acquire. The thing is, you go to a cable manufacturer and say, like, hey, I'm in wearables. It's going to be an emerging technology. You should get behind us and help us out. And they're like, how many units are you going to buy from us this year? And we're like, oh, well, 10,000. They're like, Shh. we do that every five seconds out of our factory. We're not going to do anything for you. So, like, all the things that are slowing us down in production are like the things that were the simplest in a conventional company. Um, so where we're at now, uh, what's kind of interesting is uh, all our plastic is tooled for the developer glasses. All our electronics is developed. We make custom uh, cameras, like all this stuff that's you know straight up full custom engineering. And it's all ready to go, and now we're just waiting you know, two or three weeks, hopefully we can solve this cable problem. So, And uh, oh, our first uh, 200 uh, sample units and developer glasses are going to be shipping here shortly. Uh, so, yay, yeah, I'm excited. So, I, my days, this is my typical day now. I wake up, I go spend like 10 to 12 hours with my team in the office. I go to sleep, then I wake up and I work with China and Japan way, way late into the evening, then I sleep a little bit more and then back and do it again and again and again. I don't have any weekends. Again, that's the Kickstarter thing. You know, you have to deliver on this stuff where other companies, I mean, other uh, businesses where you have VC or venture capital, you have a little bit more leeway to, you know, take your time and get it right, so, yikes. <laughs> I think that's uh, most, of, most of my story. Is there any questions you guys have? I don't know how much time we have. Actually, quite a bit. Yeah. So, original market is for gaming. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, other. So, uh, Rick and I are uh, from games and toys. And so, we naturally kind of fall into that um, vertical market for our product. But the. The companies that are approaching us, it's super exciting. There's big media companies that want to do location-based stuff. We had the, the military approach us. They, they want to take our system, put it into jets, so that or the, use it in jets. So all, modern jets are fly-by-wire, so they can disconnect all the switches that turn the motors and stuff on, run that into the simulation computer, send it to our glasses, then they put a piece of cardboard with the reflector over the window of the airplane. And you can do flight training, you know, sitting on the ground or on a, a carrier. And we actually, <clears throat> part of our team got to go out 
to this naval base and go into all these helicopters and planes and we set up and we showed these simulations, like a, a mock-up of the simulations, and they were ecstatic because one of the jets that uh, our team was working in, like, they, they did the simulation, they showed the generals and whatnot, then they pulled all the stuff off and then, like, an hour later that plane was flying off down the runway. It was super exciting for them. Um, some other interesting vertical markets that kind of excite me is uh, educational. You know, I'm, I'm big on education. Um, so, and physical therapy is another interesting one. So quite a few people have approached us for methods to help people that maybe have uh, motor skill problems. If we synthesize the world around them, we can change the rules of physics and we can help them so they can start training them in easier steps like if they have to move something around we can move the virtual thing around um, another thing is people have vision problems we can actually control where the um, the pictures are being generated on the screen we can um, have it accommodate the person that has maybe a walleye condition and slowly while they play a game pull it in and train their eye to point the right direction yes. Okay, how does it work if you already have to wear corrective um, lenses? So this is a great part about our system is we identified that right away. Um, when we were working in Valve, like everyone wears glasses. We're all nerds and have blown out eyes. So um, we made a lot of eye relief back there so that um, you can slip it right over the top of your glasses. And in the projected mode of operation, it's, it's very straightforward. It just projects out to the screen and comes back, just like you're looking at a monitor. So it's comfortable, your normal prescriptions, it doesn't affect any of that. Where other systems, you have to really jam a lens really close to your eyes and you can't put um, glasses in there. Um, <clears throat> Holodex, uh, that's something I'm kind of excited about. Our new tracking system that we just got going um, can do multiple markers. So to do this head tracking and feature tracking and wand tracking, you have to have a marker in the room. But now our new system allows you to have multiple markers in the room, and they all synchronize together. So if you put markers all around the room and put reflector hanging on your wall, it becomes a holodeck. And uh, you can have multiple people, and they're moving around, and uh, the tracking system's tracking off these markers. Okay. Applications related design, like. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, productivity, productivity apps. Um, so Rick's working on, oh, maybe I can't say the, the tool, but there's a, a tool company that we're working with that does 3D models. So he's made a plug-in for that. So you take this tool and you put, plug it into the, um, the tool and then you have your regular monitor. You're wearing Cast AR. You can work on your monitor as you normally do, but you look to the left you have your retro reflector there, you have your 3D model pops up right next to your monitor. Um, I think you're, you're showing hand gestures. Um, so some stuff that we played with, we used the Leap Motion and the Connect, and so that's pretty cool. Those just plug in and work with our systems. So we made a, like a flight simulator where you moved your hand in front of the Leap Motion. It was actually a very intuitive like, game environment. Oh, yeah, good point. Uh, it's being demoed in the dark room over here. So one hall over in the corner, look for a tent. Um, we already have a pretty big line. Um, we, sh we showed it last year, and we had a, a big line, and it, it just filled up again this year. So we're very ecstatic that um, people are super excited about it. So the demos that we're showing over there now, and this is just solely because where we are in the hardware design cycle, we have hand-built, high-definition glasses. So we have 720p projectors on each eye. So we have, uh, I'm trying to think of the game now, as Space Invaders. And when you move your body back and forth, you move your ship with your, your body position, and we have a trigger, and you can fire up, and you can shoot the Space Invaders. It's pretty simple. It's just a piece of uh, reflector hanging on the wall like a poster. And stuff's flying out at you as you blow it up. And we have a MakerBot where we have transparent retro reflector over the top of the MakerBot um, builds area. You wear the glasses, you look inside, you see a planetary gear that's been printed, and then you see all the planetary gears 
spinning around inside that haven't been printed yet, animated, plus a bunch of statistics, like whatever degrees they're rotating at and stuff like that. And then we have um, a similar game, like the zombie thing I was talking about. It's a head-to-head -head zombie game where it's flat retroflector on the table, like you'd be playing on your card table or on your living room. You have two people playing against each other. You can choose to collaborate or fight each other. There's zombies in the maze. They will chase you. They're not much of a threat until you get the flag. There's a flag. When you get the flag, they chase you really fast and they swarm on you. But here's a trick. If you go in there with your buddies, get the flag and be a Pied Piper and, and lead the zombies. And you'll have like 100 zombies following you. Then you encircle your other player and get them. Uh, there's some other cool things there. You hold the trigger down, it makes a giant bullet and stuff. And so that's that's our demo. We have our our sample proof plastics. So what we're actually cutting the tools for to to make in a in a few weeks. And so you can take a look at those. There, you can open them up. The, you can see the electronics in there. There's uh, we got it down to two chips. There's the Altera chip that's doing all the sensor fusion. So it's doing gyro, um, camera fusion. It does image stabilization. It drives all the projectors. And then there's a, another part, TI part, and it's doing the, the video receiving. Uh, the type of projectors that we're using, they're liquid crystal on silicon. They are not HiMax. Uh, they're Citizen Miyota. Uh, we've worked closely with them, another company that really wanted to bust into this market. And they're actually allowing us to drive them in a, a very interesting way so that um, you get rid of a lot of artifacts that you normally have in L-cost type projectors. So our projector, it's kind of cool. So the, the stats on our projector, here's a funny story if I still have time. So our optics partner came to us. They took a look at our demo. They thought it was really cool. They said, we think we can improve a whole lot. And like, OK. And they said, send us your prescriptions to your lenses. So I sent it to them. They simulated it. And they came back and they said, this is, can't be correct because our simulations show 16 to 24 pixels overlapping in the corners of the, the image all blurred together. And I'm like, yeah, it sounds about right because I just hot glued the lenses together. <laughs> so the projectors you're going to see over there are all hot glued together, hand built by me. So they went back, they built a projector um, simulation for us. And they're like, can we build this for you? And it was like 32 millimeters, it was too big. And, I was, and I'd been playing around with this free optical um, software. And I'm like, well, I think we can do it in 20 millimeters of space. And I sent them some ideas. And they're like, uh, we don't know if that'll work, but we'll see. And so they, they came back like a couple months later. And they're like, you really made our engineers you know, scratch their head, but we did it. 20 millimeters. It's about the size of a sugar cube across. And then uh, for our production glasses, we have to get some custom parts made, but we're going to be able to be just like an oblong sugar cube on top when we're done. So that's exciting. It's like, it, it's it's funny when we showed them originally, the, um, the optical engineer that was with them was like, so you hot glue these together, and I'm like, yeah, I, I hold them in place, and I hot glue them, and then I look and project and look, and then I heat them and then bend them and move them around and. He's like, where'd you go to school to learn optics? I'm like, I didn't. I just, you know, I kind of read about it, and you know, it's just projector, right? How hard could it be? And he's like, why did I even go to school? So maybe I should. I think my time's up. Yeah, within one minute. One more question, if someone has it. Ooh, ooh. All right. Uh, it's just still finishing up. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a full IMU in there. It's actually an Invincence um, with magnetometer. So I, it's, it sling wards around. Um, so. Yeah, maybe I can get one more in. Oh, the favorite experience on that? Uh, oh, just by the way. Gosh, there's, there's a bunch. Like the. The inklings of the RTS, the real-time strategy, like the, the simulations, like Rick put together a simple game where you use the wand, you trigger, you pull up, and you can zoom into your troops. And if you trigger and push away, you zoom away, and you can zoom the map way out. You can zoom to where you see the whole map. You can zoom and scroll side to side. You can select tanks, and you can move them around to mock, mock battle. He didn't get the gameplay done. But just to, to see that I can do 
favorite, my, one of my favorite games, real uh, Command and Conquer, that it's I'm gonna be able to just roll this out on my table and play against all my friends and just be able to look across from at them and when I get that good like hit on them. It's great. All right, thank you guys.